Just before we have our dessert, I invited the club's chef and his staff out here so that I can publicly acknowledge and thank and praise them for the wonderful meal that we are enjoying. Uh, and I'm hoping that Peter can hear me and, uh, and we can see who is uh, behind this all. Having had a job myself uh, scrubbing out pots and pans in a commercial kitchen many years ago, I have a soft spot for any and all of those in our, uh, who, who do the less public and glamorous tasks in our community. And as communal dining is such an integral part of, uh, an integral means of establishing right relationship, as far as I'm concerned, we are all in this together. So, uh, so there is only one toast today, and that is to you guys, uh, wait staff and management included, uh, to, the staff. to the staff. Thank you, Peter. The Bible has a lot to say about table fellowship and food, and that's why I've invited you all here today. One of the most common illustrations of heaven used by Jesus is that of a banquet. And with all respect to the Royal Sydney Golf Club, that banquet is going to be infinitely better than this one. There you go. One moment your praises are being sung, and the next you're being cut down to size. Please don't be offended, life's like that. But I was comparing this to heaven itself. I've just handed out a copy of chapter 11 of the book of Leviticus on your tables. Now, if there aren't enough copies to go around on any particular table, please let me know. There's enough for everybody, but I may not have apportioned them out table by table. Uh, chapter 11 of Leviticus is all about food and on first appearance it looks like a list of dietary restrictions which the ancient people of God led by Moses at this time uh, were to observe and food restrictions regarding animal products ranging from pork to shellfish but in order to understand the scriptures best we need first of all to put passages in their right context. Now Moses had not just seen another episode on television of uh, Bear Grylls putting everything from snails to centipedes in his mouth trying to survive in the wild and thinking well the people of God would have to be able to do better than that so I'd better make up a list of rules for them, do's and don'ts for them to follow. Now, the right context here is that this is the first teaching that Moses has placed after the sinful disobedience of his two nephew priests in waiting in the previous, uh, resulting in their execution by God in the previous chapter 10. What I'd like to suggest is, this, is that in this next chapter 11, uh, on unclean, unclean and detestable creatures, uh, we do not just have a list which leads us to a menu which was formerly used to distinguish the ancient people of God. This list is not an end in itself. It has a central and unifying characteristic, but we don't see what that is until we get towards the end of the chapter to the last mentioned creatures. Now by this stage Moses has already listed in these early verses 36 creatures by name and the reader may have started to experience species fatigue and you may be tempted just to skim over these last ones but these are the key to understanding the whole chapter. Now, highlighted for you on the bottom of the page, verse 42. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever walks on all fours, 
Whatever has many feet, of all the creatures that creep on the ground, you shall not eat them, for they are detestable. Does that sound a little bit flat? A little bit dry? A little bit bland? That's how you might read that verse if you were suffering from species fatigue. Try reading it like this. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever walks on all fours, whatever has many feet, of all the creatures that creep on the ground, you shall not eat them, for they are detestable. If the first mentioned item in a list is any indication of its importance, as is idolatry in the Ten Commandments, what preeminent item commences the list of creatures in this verse? Whatever crawls on its belly. What creature crawls on its belly? Genesis 3.14 So the Lord God said to the serpent, You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. If you were an observant Jew in the ancient world, to hear the words crawl and belly mentioned in the same sentence would flag attention to an earlier event, the fall, where sin and death itself first entered God's perfect world. And it would be picked up as quickly as we moderns might recognise the words walk and water mentioned in the same sentence as a reminder of a particular New Testament event. Please note the habitat and diet to which the serpent has been banished there in Genesis is identical with that of the pig here in verse 7, which spends so much time wallowing in the mud and using its snout to break open the ground to find and eat the special underground food storage parts of certain plants, including truffles, I understand, necessarily consuming a quantity of soil in the process. And it's the same as that of the rabbit in verse 6, which has its burrow under the ground, eating that which grows there in the soil from both above and below, as well as a volume of soil. Nobody seems to know what the coney of verse 5 is, but in respect of the camel in verse 4, of the last five cases of plague reported in Saudi Arabia, according to the internet, four were caused by people eating raw camel liver, which hosts the microbe responsible for that fatal disease. The shellfish that are then uh, that do not have fin fins and scales, which are then mentioned in, in verse 10, are well known for, uh, after those forbidden terrestrial animals, are well known for causing food poisoning, if not eaten fresh. And following them from verse 13 on, the birds that are prohibited include scavengers like vultures and ravens, which feed on carrion, that is, dead carcasses with the remaining birds being, uh, including violent carnivorous predators like eagles and hawks. These are not the sweet nectar-eating birds we see in a flower garden. All through this chapter, there are associations with and reminders of death and the fall, from which this judgment against the serpent to crawl on its belly and eat dust forms a part. But I actually don't want you to get bogged down in the detail from its early verses. Rather, try and look at the big picture. Let me try and show you. Have you ever seen... Have you ever watched movie strips showing uh, what was seen through the periscopes of submarines in the Second World War? When a submarine was looking for enemy shipping to sink, Sometimes they would not just find a single ship and sink it. Sometimes, if they were really lucky, 
they might find dozens of cargo ships in a convoy with an escort of warships all moving together. Sometimes, if they were really, really lucky, they might hit the jackpot. They might find the enemy fleet command with its flagship in the form of a battleship in the centre of an armada surrounded by a flotilla of smaller cruisers, destroyers and frigates all around it like a swarm of bees protecting it from attack. This flagship is where the enemy, enemy's admiral of the fleet is directing his navy. Such a ship may be thousands of tons of floating fortress whose flash of gunfire may transform the night sky like lightning and send shells to their target over the horizon, out of sight, like the Missouri, which has visited Sydney on occasions, was capable of doing. But the submarine will hover around this fleet like a sheepdog moving a mob of sheep, waiting to get a clear line of sight to the flagship. Unlike the mob of sheep that knows that the sheepdog is there, this fleet is unaware that they are being observed and sized up. But the, cap the submarine captain knows that a well-aimed torpedo will dispatch this flagship's fatal shot moving silently through the water before anybody realises there's an opponent about to attack. Is not chapter 11 like God showing us what may be seen of his enemy through the periscope? It's not the prohibited animals, fish and birds as such which are the enemy, but all these creatures constitute an association with the enemy by reminding us of the fall. The chapter hovers around this zoological armada for 40 verses, just letting us take it all in. But like with the submarine captain who does not wish to disclose his presence and position by picking off one of the peripheral vessels, for him, the lesser ships in the armada are not the prize kill. So too, God gives us a view of the peripheral in these early verses in a crescendo of unclean and detestable creatures and all the consequences resulting from contamination by contact with them. But then he zooms in on the likeness of the real target in this verse 42. The devil himself or Satan, that ancient serpent commanded to crawl on its belly and represented here by a short list of similarly described creatures found to be creeping on the ground. God has in his divine armory a secret weapon for this enemy and he is about to blow Satan out of the water in the greatest battle of all time. His secret weapon will deliver the kill shot, as Hollywood action movies call such, and be destroyed in the process, like the torpedo, but unlike the fragments of shrapnel that formerly constituted that captain's torpedo, and which sank along with the enemy flagship to the bottom, God's secret weapon rises triumphant from below. This is not Humpty Dumpty whom all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put back together again, this is the risen Lord Jesus we are talking about now, who later declared after that battle the breathtaking and staggering words, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. 
The shockwaves from this event have been reverberating around the globe ever since and will continue to do so until he returns. But for many, Jesus' death was just another Roman execution. Like many, they inflicted on a downtrodden, occupied nation in their vast empire. But for those who believe, this is the most significant and cherished event in all history. If you are a Christian person here today, this is the Jesus whom we worship and adore as the gracious and merciful creator, saviour, God that he is. And correspondingly, Satan is the one we should loathe, abhor and despise for the vulgar, obscene and disgusting creature that he is. Strong language? Not strong enough. Moses has placed this chapter 11 precisely where it should be. Just following the sin and death of his two nephews by some sort of fireball from God, immediately calling upon his whole nation to detest whatever crawled on its belly and a variety of associated creatures. It was perfectly appropriate to do so. Moses hasn't nominated for them who the real detestable creature is. He didn't have to. For us who live on this side of the coming of Jesus now, over 3,000 years since Moses, when we come to the Bible, we are, be we are being shown here in Le Leviticus 11, just after the sinful disobedience of Aaron's sons, that God knows where this sin ultimately comes from. And he has therefore identified Satan as his future target. Just like the submarine captain who patiently plans to deliver his king hit by lining up the enemy flagship has identified his future target. To help that submarine captain estimate the, tar the target's range and get his bearings, his window has simple uh, linear scales on simple vertical and horizontal axes which meet at right angles, forming a cross. How fitting that this naval illustration should be able to be applied even more fully to God's means of attacking his enemy, because that is where the greatest battle of all time the conflict against evil itself took place and Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross. It doesn't sound like this battle is in the same league as the build-up I've been giving to the naval weapon and the naval target and its weapon, does it? I've just said that this was the greatest battle of all time that took place. I started talking today about the Normandy landing as the greatest seaborne invasion of all time. That landing has been immortalised in the 1962 black and white movie, The Longest Day. And again more recently, I noticed in colour and 3D the movie D-Day screening at Sydney's IMAX theatre last year. The genre of war, me, war movie has now become an art form and Hollywood just churns them out like a production line. And glory is perhaps the dominant ingredient to guarantee the movie's success. What a Jesus, our warrior and champion, 
in this battle, greatest battle of all time. As he approached the battlefield, exhausted and injured from being awake all night going from court to court and from being abused by the flogging he then received, unable to continue carrying his own cross and having Simon of Cyrene pressed into service to do that for him, he enters the conflict. Simply to, simply to be stripped naked, nailed to a wooden cross and raised up in the air to die as a humiliating public spectacle. By this world standard, <coughs> not very heroic. But Jesus was never more glorious than when he died for us that day. He lived the perfect life and died the perfect death in full obedience to his Father. He lived right and died right. None of us have lived right like him. and We cannot do anything about that. We cannot change the past. But we too can die right. To all those who are here today, alive, with the breath of life in their lungs, we have the chance to change our future if we have not done so already. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Now at this point there's various ways of finishing a talk like this but I'm going to do something a bit unusual and stop right here with Jesus saying he has crossed over from death to life and leave it hanging there like a book with the last page torn out and invite you all here to continue talking about this and try and link what Jesus has said in the New Testament with what Moses has said in the, in the Old Testament at the point we've reached in the book of Leviticus. <coughs> Leviticus 11.43 opens with the confronting statement that we ourselves can be included on the list of creatures that God declares as detestable and commands us not to make ourselves such. The Hebrew word shikutz is the one we translate here as detestable. It occurs only 18 times in the whole Bible, 13 of which appear in the book of Leviticus, and 11 of those appear in this chapter. Moses details here the two ways to live. The detestable life, and the life of holiness in the next verse 44. But please note what's in between these two extremes in this curious sentence in no man's land to continue the battlefield image. Do not make for yourselves, to, sorry, do not make yourselves unclean by means of them or be made unclean by them. Now I hope there might be an English teacher on my table because my grammar is so rusty, I need help. I remember something about active and passive voice in sentence construction and something about transitive and intransitive verbs. And these two verb commands, do not make and or be made, are not just idle repetitions. They are two distinct words in the Hebrew which I've printed out for you with its English equivalent courtesy of Mr. Kohlenberger's interlinear translation up here if you wish to see it. Now the trick with Hebrew is you've got to read it from right to left so just bear that in mind when you line the left to right of English up with the Hebrew. 
just to help you get started, please try not to be distracted by all the details in this chapter, but rather focus on the fact that there are two judgments which have been determined here. The first is, to be de is being declared unclean, the second is being declared detestable. Four points to note. One, both judgments may be extended beyond the list of creatures used to introduce them to us, to we humans ourselves. Two, the first judgment is reversible as it has a sunset clause, literally, told again and again, you are unclean till evening. Three, the second judgment, however, is absolute and there is no indication of there ever being any reprieve. And fourthly, verse 43 tells us that the self-same thing which is capable of making us temporarily unclean can also make us permanently detestable. May I please also suggest, suggest you bear one, in, one idea in mind that as we mature with our use of language to understand thought, we can utilise uh, we can receive and utilise abstract ideas as well as concrete ones to do that. When a little boy goes to his first Bible study with his dad, not really expecting to be able to contribute anything, he's delighted to discover he knows the answer to the first question. Why couldn't Jesus come down from the cross? He raises his hand, but before he's asked for, for his answer, he listens to a range of responses from the adults there, like, because of his love for you and me, and because the scriptures cannot be broken, and he's bewildered, because he knows it's the nails that stop Jesus coming down from the cross. As, I, as adults, we know that with the flexibility of language, questions like who, sorry, how, what, and why may be better answered with abstract notions while questions like who, when and where may be less so. I'll just say that again because it's so important with the flexibility of language, questions like how, what and why may be better answered with abstract notions while questions like who, when and where may be less so. The literalist will have difficulty embracing illustrations and parables and will seek to understand the scriptures literalistically, limiting his scope to the physical. But the Bible uses a variety of grammatical designs helping us to understand because it's interested in understanding what the author said. It's how we communicate ourselves in both speech and writing. In Leviticus 11.43, we've been presented with a range of whatever creatures which are detestable in God's sight and have the capacity to render us unclean either with us making ourselves such or having been made so. Please understand, unclean does not mean dirty or unhygienic, but unfit to approach God who is white hot in purity and perfection. Now, before you give up and wonder what I am talking about, an example. If I purchase the services of a prostitute and enter some sort of counterfeit relationship with her that simulates the physical side of marriage, I am being proactive in leading a, an ungodly life. This is like the proactive Hebrew word translated by you make yourselves unclean, here in verse 43. If, however, at the, at the other end of the spectrum, I'm over there at Bondi Beach, wandering down the street, minding my own business, and I turn a corner, 
to be faced by a female wearing next to nothing or some billboard photograph of a model advertising lingerie, I can avert my eyes and fumble around for my mental delete button, but it's too late. My brain has processed that image like lightning. I'm not to visualise that person in a way which has been reserved for her husband. And that reaction would also be ungodly and in this instance, like the reactive Hebrew word translated as or you be made unclean. And even though this outcome is reactive rather than proactive, neither one is the holy life to which God is calling his people in the next verses 44 and 45. And both results point to my desperate need for God's mercy and total dependence on his pure and perfect saviour. Let me finish with prayer. Dear Father God, thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for loving us. We know that Neptune is a fantasy, as are the mermaids in the story that was read. But we know that very real are the bodies of the dead who have sunk to the bottom of the sea whether from conflict or misadventure or other reasons, they now encircle the globe. We know also that death itself entered our world because of Satan. We know that Jesus has the authority to declare all food clean because it is he who has overcome the one to whom those provisionally forbidden creatures pointed. We thank you that Jesus has defeated Satan at the cross and that in your amazing love for us, we can benefit from his victory. Thank you for your forbearance as you wait for people to repent. We know that in Satan's death throes, he is still a menace, still spreading lies, as he thrashes around in his fury, for he knows that his time is short. We look forward to the return of the Lord Jesus when Satan will be finally thrown into the lake of fire. Before that happens, we pray. May it please you to save every single person in this room. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, that's it from me. We're still, we've got this uh, room for, till 4.30. I was planning to suggest to you that there's a lovely ferry ride at 4.38 back to the city, but I don't think today's the best day to go on a ferry back to the city if you came by public transport. But it's over to you now. Please continue to enjoy. We're having uh, dessert. There'll be coffee and tea uh, served a little bit later. Please continue enjoying fellowship and food and thank you all for coming.